This is your invitation to leap ahead in your engineering career. The inaugural Product Development Expo, PDX, happening in Phoenix, Arizona on Tuesday, May 14th, 2024, brings you face to face with the engineering elite. These aren't just any speakers, they're the industry's highest performing product development engineers, ready to share the methods and strategies that have defined their success. Imagine learning design for manufacturability from those who've redefined it, diving deep into tolerance analysis with pioneers, exploring novel engineering applications for Excel, and unlocking unique 3D printing strategies all in one place. These high-caliber engineers will open their playbooks, offering practical, hands-on lessons forged over decades in the trenches of innovation. Don't miss out on this unparalleled opportunity to absorb the wisdom of those who've led the charge in engineering breakthroughs. PDX is your chance to not just meet but learn directly from these legends of engineering. Mark the date, May 14th, 2024, in Phoenix. Elevate your skills, ignite your creativity, and join a community of growth-minded engineering professionals at PDX. Learn more at teampipeline.us forward slash PDX. I can and want to pay more for like a cleaner, more sustainable future. But, you know, a lot of people can't. Like for them, like, can we really ask them to like pay more for something that they don't immediately benefit from? Hello and welcome to the Being an Engineer podcast. Today, we are privileged to speak with Paul Lee, a renewable energy engineer in Los Angeles who is always searching for new ways to harness energy from sustainable sources. His current work involves planning resources for a 100% clean energy city as an energy policy analyst with the Mayor's Office of Energy and Sustainability of the City of Los Angeles. He also worked on developing projects such as utility-scale wind, solar, geothermal, biomass resources, as well as energy storage, such as batteries, pumped hydro, and other emerging technologies. Paul, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Hey, Aaron. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. All right. Can you tell me what made you decide to become an engineer? I, yeah, this story goes back to when I was in high school in my physics class. Oh, but Oh, there's one, there's one, uh, thing I need to update you on is because I'm currently in a career transition. And so I no longer working for the city of Los Angeles, but I will be starting a career with the U.S. Department of Energy. So congratulations. In the same That's world, exciting. The same clean energy space. And then I'll be starting yeah. that in a, in a few short weeks. Wow. Congratulations. That's terrific. Thank you. So. There's a lot that you've done, obviously, but I think the focal point for much of this interview is going to be based on a film that you were featured in. The film is called Cities of the Future. Imagine a world where life on Earth is totally sustainable. Solar energy powers entire cities. Flying cars travel on highways in the sky. This isn't science fiction. The creators of Dream Big invite you on a journey into the future. Where today's engineers are designing solutions that will change the way we live forever. Can you tell us a little bit about what this film is and what your part in it was? Yeah, this is this film. It's produced by the American Society of Civil Engineers. And really the goal of it is to highlight the engineering profession, specifically civil, and really envisioning what a f the cities of the future could be. And it's spotlighting engineers, young engineers, engineers from all disciplines. Um, it's highlighting different cities and technologies to really inspire um, mostly people that want to pursue engineering and also to highlight the field. Um, 
give us make us look cool and also to make us you know, more appealing to students who want to pursue engineering in the future so yeah we, awesome. we travel across the world highlighting cool stuff um and then really giving this vision about what cities could look like uh decades into the future i'm really curious about how your role in this came to be i mean that's kind of a a big deal right getting to be participate as a, a, a character, if you will, in this film. Give us the backstory on that. How, how did that happen? Yeah. It's a little surreal. <laughs> I think I'm still like getting to grips with the reality of what's happening. But um, I've been involved with ASE, the American Society of Civil Engineers, ever since I was in college. And I've been well involved. I was selected as one of their quote unquote new faces of engineering submitted a handful of videos so they they knew who i was and the american society they filmed uh, a film in the past called dream big it was very successful it was it was on netflix it was narrated by i think jeff bridges and that was a hit and that was inspiring a lot of kids to become engineers and i think they this was a time for a sequel and they were looking for and then in the in the previous movie in dream big they highlighted a handful of engineers and they kind of wanted to do the same thing and that interviewed a, a handful of younger engineers who weren't too camera shy and i was selected to be to be one of the people to to be featured and interviewed with the director and one thing came after the other and lo and behold i'm, I'm in the film amazing amazing so what are some of the technologies that are showcased in in the film i mean you mentioned that you traveled I guess, across the world, what were you looking for specific things or did you already know about kind of new and emerging technologies in the field of energy and sustainability? And, and you went to those places specifically to, to see what was happening there. For So the movie had a specific angle it wanted to take. So I've been in the clean energy industry for about seven years now, and I've seen all the technologies or, or, or a handful of them. Everything from established to things that are up and coming. And the movie, I think it had to strike a balance between technologies that were very kind of wow on screen. Yeah. As well as are, are these like new technologies? Are they going to be contributing to the cities of the future? And so, yeah, I can talk a lot about my personal work and technologies that I've seen. And then some of the technologies that were featured in the film. And one of them... Just to highlight is Caltech. They're developing, sending like solar panels into space and beaming that energy down because, you know, on planet Earth. Wow. Interesting. Finite huh. surface area, right? To collect yeah, yeah. energy. And then in space, it's theoretically infinite. And so they're, they're developing technologies to, to launch these panels into space and have like really interesting mechanisms to like unfurl these these solar panels and and like microwave technologies to beam it down to earth. So I think that's a very promising technology, like not maybe in our generation, but in generations to come. And we're all waiting. I had never heard about anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's very like <laughs> the cutting edge of research. So is that a technology that, that exists uh, specifically the, the wireless transmission of that energy back to earth, or is this, this is bleeding edge research that's happening in the hopes of developing that technology. Well, I mean, wireless energy transfer, I mean, it's, it's been around, it's like microwave technology. I mean, like cell phone communication is, you know, it's like wireless energy transfer, right? So it's like, it's like light. <laughs> You're just sending so light, at, light down. At what point will we be able to drive our electric cars without having to plug in that kind of, <laughs> that kind of power, right? Is that part of the cities of the future? I don't like maybe every one of our cars has an internal fusion fusion reactor and we just never have to plug in. But um, I mean, that specifically isn't featured, but we are envisioning what technology could evolve to. So it's a combination yeah. of things like very far into the future, technologies that's very near and dear now, as well as technology that's like worked in the past forever. I mean, we went to Amsterdam, people, the primary mode of transportation is biking. And the reason why it's great, like you don't, we don't have to use new technologies to advance a society. We can just use existing technology that just works well and maybe just needs to be, you know, resurfaced or repurposed. Yeah. Hmm. What are some of the other technologies that uh, maybe if you could break them into kind of two categories, one, like the wow factor technology that 
may not ever come to fruition, but would be really cool if it did versus the technologies that, uh, yeah, there's a high degree of confidence that this stuff is, is either already exists or is about to exist. And in the next 20, 30 years, you're probably going to start seeing this. Yeah. Yeah. I think they're, yeah, they all like fall on a spectrum of so-called like technology readiness. Hmm. I think the space solar is definitely pretty far out as far as whether or not we'll see that in, in commercial applications. Uh, another technology that we highlight, I think it's kind of like, it's almost there are these ideas of kind of vertical air taxis. So these mm. things are just like bigger versions of drones and apologies to Joby, because I think that's, that's like a gross oversimplification of the technology, <laughs> but these are like quieter than helicopters, way more efficient. They run on battery power. And essentially, like, this is what people kind of almost think about when they think about, like, flying cars. So, like, people stuck in traffic, like, we've just unlocked all of the airspace for people to get from point A to point B in, like, dense urban environments. Yeah. And I I know that certain cities are are experimenting with it or they want to start kind of putting this out there and letting people try it. Of course, there's going to be a difference between um, what we think is going to happen and, and what actually happens. But based on what the film highlights as the potential for um, air travel in, in the future, you mentioned it was kind of like a large drone. Uh, help us build a little bit more context around that. I mean, is it is it really, you know, four rotors above your head spinning or is there an enclosure around it? What, what does that look like? What is the experience like for the the person inside? Yeah. So I didn't I didn't personally get to ride inside it, but like they're they're going through all those approvals. But yeah, they have it has four rotors on top, all battery powered, and as a pilot, theoretically, theoretically no pilot. These things could be completely autonomous. Yeah. And then seating for you know maybe four like six or eight. Oh, wow. Okay. So not just individuals, but groups of people. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Mm. Okay. What else? What other technologies were presented during the film that were, were particularly interesting? There are the, like the technologies that I've worked on, which is like renewable power. So just solar, wind, just large, large swaths of like solar fields and, and wind farms. Because mm-hmm. just just the density of the energy that we need and kind of like the availability of it, we're just going to need to have just astronomical volumes of these renewable sources. So that's that's being highlighted. Another technology that's being highlighted are smart buildings. So there was a building in Amsterdam that had a lot of like these sensor arrays that kind of opened and closed its built like its windows based on like the occupancy rate. So like a building that kind of like understands its occupancy and kind of dynamically changes its state mm. accordingly. So it's like a smart building, so to speak. And I, I know like that's that's being deployed in like places here and there, but it was really cool to see it like in an entire office space. Yeah, I bet. And you were you got to be there in person, right? For a lot of this. Yeah, yeah, that was very cool. So what was your role? Were were you kind of like the subject matter expert and they'd they'd highlight a technology and then and then you'd talk about it? Is that how it happened? Yeah, my role is really I think it's I play multiple hats in the movies. Like one, yeah, I'm the subject matter expert. I'm also like this mentor that's mentoring this group of kids. They're competing in the science competition, like city like future cities. They're creating a model of what they're envisioning to be a future city. And they're looking for me for guidance. And I'm sort of traveling the world, seeing inspiration, mentoring these kids, giving them tips on how to build their projects. So a little bit, yeah, for me, it's like I'm bringing some subject matter expertise in my domain, which is like energy. But I'm also like exploring different opportunities and also different technologies that can like that I can learn from and also inspire these kids in the film that are also using that information and knowledge to to excel in their competition. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to um, wind power generation. And I sometimes drive to California. In fact, I was just there uh, twice, actually. I've been there twice this year already on a couple of business trips. And there are these giant um, uh, wind farms, right, that are that are uh, just outside of the city, like as you're going into LA. You know where I'm talking about? Yep. Yep. Like from out of okay. Palm Springs. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Right there, right in Palm Springs. Yeah. 
And uh, we noticed that uh, it looked like anyway, there, there were almost like different generations of, uh, of, of these windmills. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how that technology has advanced and, and what some of the newer generation, um, uh, wind energy has, is offering that, that the older generation isn't offering and, and where we're going in the future for that? Yeah, for, for wind technology. Yeah, wind has just been a staple of clean energy for, for decades. And yeah, when you, when you see, when you go, you see like, yeah, these are, they're all kind of different, but also kind of similar. So I know a lot of, like some of them are built using like a trust network. Some of them are on like a monopole. And there's a really like a difference in like, so the trust system was very prominent when labor costs were cheap and material was expensive. And it's it since flipped mm. where now material costs are cheap, but labor is expensive. And so that that's just the transition of the economy. Um, additional advances in wind technology, it's really like size. So just being able to transport enormous blades, because I think you get like a cubic increase in power, like the higher up you go as a function. Oh, interesting. Height. And okay. so the higher that we can build wind turbines, the more power that we can get and much more efficiently. So, so another advance was just being able to build taller and also be, being able to build offshore. And that's the, the overall height of the tower, not the length of the blade itself. Uh, it's a combination of both like the height and the length of the blades. And then okay. Okay. equations that people can, can derive. And I'm sure there's like some specs that you can look up, but yeah, yeah. It's really the height that is like the most important part. How long are those blades? I'm sure they vary, right? But like some of those in Palm Springs, uh, it's hard to gauge from the road, right? But they're, they gotta be just gigantic. They are pretty massive. I don't have a number at the top of my head. Okay. But yeah. Okay. And this one to Google away. So <laughs> the audience do. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Let's see. Um, I'm sure you were able to hear about, and maybe you already had pretty good understanding of this, but uh, policymakers, as as they relate to, as their activities relate to clean energy, renewable energy, and, and thinking towards uh, the, the future, right? Cities of the future. What what advice would you give to to policymakers who are looking to, to contribute to the development of, of sustainable, future-oriented cities? I spent, yeah, I spent... A considerable amount of time like in the policymaking space so sometimes being a policymaker myself sometimes being a bridge between policymakers and engineers and just getting like a different perspective on how decisions are made because oftentimes the engineering solution doesn't really jive well with what people want broadly and i would say that to policymakers that want to build future cities we we have technologies like we have solutions in place it's just a matter of how much they care and how much they want to push because one of some of the biggest costs is really like political capital political will costs like in order to make the energy transition happen now it's not going to be cheap and so really like getting people on board like hey your your power bill is going to go up that's going to be uncomfortable but it's going to be you know, we're going to, we're going to see great benefits, maybe like, maybe not as much in the short term, but definitely in the long term. And this is where you really need that like political leadership and these policymakers that have like a longer term vision of where society can be instead of like just focusing on like short term and next election cycles. So like if they do truly care, like making policy decisions that are durable and long lasting and enables us engineers to build the things that we are recommending, um, it's really my advice. Like we have the te- like the, the technologies that we have now to build a city of the future that's like very sustainable. And then how are people define sustainability? Like we have a lot of those technologies now. We just need to like build it. <laughs> yeah. Can you think of any any stories off the top of your head? Maybe you were directly involved in them, or maybe it's another group that you're familiar with, but where um uh how engineers developed a new technology that that is being used in some s- sort of sustainable n- nature right now, whether it's wind or or um, uh, hydro or something else altogether. Any any stories that come to mind where a, a new technology was developed that's that's being used now? 
that's being used now. So really, a technology that's very interesting now is hydrogen, is using hydrogen as a form of long duration energy storage. So, so really a crux of the problem of like a full energy transition is like, like that vast stockpile of energy. So right now, like you can stockpile coal, you can just have mounds of coal laying around. Mm. And on a rainy day, you can just burn all that coal when, when, you know, like the clouds covering the solar panels and there's no wind blowing. You can stockpile tons of natural gas into like these caverns, but I mean, they all have like these problems. They can like, these things can leak and coal can get into the water. And so there hasn't been an exact equivalence for hydrogen or, or some sort of renewable technology. Like batteries are okay, but they don't have like the energy density or the stockpile of batteries. Like it's impossible. Like you would need like a mountain of batteries and that's just like not feasible. Whereas like technology, well, whereas hydrogen, like specifically hydrogen derived from renewable sources. So you let, use electrolysis, you zap water, you can you split it into hydrogen and oxygen and you can keep the hydrogen molecules. Either you can either burn it through a generator, generate electricity, or you can use it through um, a fuel cell to generate power. And that's a technology like hydrogen has been around forever. Fuel cells have been around forever. I mean, just right now where I think the technology and the cost and everything is sort of coming together where hydrogen could be the next next big thing um, for the energy transition. And we are like California, at least, is like planning on building a lot of hydrogen systems as part of its energy portfolio. Th- that's really interesting. And it makes me want to ask you about EVs, right? I mean, EVs, they have become much more popular than they were before, thanks largely to to Tesla. But now other companies are jumping on that bandwagon. But there's al- almost been like a backsliding a little bit, right? I, I know Ford had early predictions of, of uh, the volumes that they were going to be manufacturing in terms of number of, of vehicles, right? EV uh, vehicles. That's a duplicate as an electric vehicle vehicles. Anyway, uh, they've they've since revised those numbers and and cut them down. I think it was in half or something, a lot less. And there's been speculation around the world that there's just not enough raw materials in the earth to satisfy the demand for for what it would take to really truly make that transition to to EVs. Like you know, for the vast majority of of folks out there who are driving a vehicle. Now, on the other hand, there's there's hydrogen, which there was there have been kind of fits and spurts of of hydrogen fueled vehicles but it's never really taken off in the way that that EVs have but now we're in this situation where there's starting to be some infrastructure for EVs and and we're starting to learn or at least there's speculation that there might not be be enough raw materials to to really fuel the uh the, the volume of batteries we need do you have any any comments or opinions on how that all is going to play out yeah i mean that's like fascinating to like dig into like the global supply chain it's like i'm i'm sure i'm sure someone's like run the numbers on like do we have enough cobalt like for the full energy transition and like what other rare earth minerals that we need I would say so there's been some debate regarding using hydrogen for kind of vehicle fuels. But so from from what I've seen and from what I've been kind of like pitched and like what the analysis have shown is that hydrogen is a very promising technology for these like quote unquote like hard to decarbonize sectors more in the industrial front. So like port operations, perhaps even like aviation or, or like shipping, can, like shipping boats, trucks, things that need like a huge volume of energy to go like very long distances. Hydrogen could be a very, very techno- like very promising technology because the only way to add more battery power is to stack more batteries and batteries are heavy. And so you get like this like diminishing return curve as far as just like adding batteries for, for more miles. Um, I don't know where that's going to go. I think that's like a function of like the market and the economy. I mean, this inflation's pretty bad right now. I think we're still recovering from the pandemic as far as like recovering our supply chain. So it's it's hard to tell, really. Um, I don't have a crystal ball, but I think it's just yeah. going to be like how fast technologies develop. Is one going to win over the next? Who is making these investments? But hydrogen isn't out of the game as far as like fueling the transportation sector. 
specifically yeah, it seems like, like it's making a little bit of a comeback right now yeah going back to the film and renewable energy for cities what technology do you think is going to be the most immediate that gets implemented into you know more of our our, our daily living into the, the power grid and um, you know to some extent uh, many of these already have been but is there going to be a a, a you know tidal shift in one energy or the other uh, say in the next 10 years do you think I think in the next 10 years, so, I mean, there's a lot of, like, economic analysis where just just the price of solar, the price of, like, batteries, um, like, s- conventional solar, conventional wind, these these are, things are starting to, like, asymptotically, like, level out. But they're still, the costs are still reducing every year. And, like, battery, lithium-ion battery technologies, like, for energy storage, those are receiving, like, a much, the slope of the cost reduction is very steep. Like it hasn't really like asymptotically bottomed out. And so what I think what we'll really see is like, you know, further deployments of wind and solar. A lot of these times the marginal costs are beating out coal, sometimes even natural gas. So like just economically, you'll see these replacements with more progressive states, more progressive areas. Like you'll see a more aggressive push for renewables. But I think what we'll see in the next 10 years is like more deployments of like lithium ion batteries for energy storage mm-hmm. because they have like just from an economics and electrical engineering and like power flow, like an like a power systems perspective, just having more batteries on the grid is great. It solves so many problems, like not to get into the weeds of like voltage regulation and frequency regulation and like all these different like, like benefits that batteries have on the grid. And like grid operators is like going to like suck these things up because it just enhances the value. Like you, you get more, for, more bang for your buck on the power with installing batteries and the lower, the, the cheaper they get, the more value they bring. And so, like, that's my prediction is, like, we're going to keep seeing a steady increase of renewables, but, like, an aggressive increase in, in battery and energy source technologies on the grid. Yeah. You mentioned the, the the costs for some of these energy sources continues to go down. How do you feel about solar and the expectation for, for future costs to implement solar? I, a few years ago, put solar panels on the roof of our home. And it was stupid expensive. <laughs> Honestly, if I had it to do over again, I don't think I would do it because I just have not seen the returns on on what it cost to put these solar panels on. Do you see the cost of solar dropping precipitously over the near future, or is it con- continue to be you know fairly expensive? I think it's gonna it's gonna. I, in my prediction is that solar we're gonna see like a steady decline in cost. But the thing is, like with solar on roofs, like a lot a lot of it is driven by policy where each individual state or city has different incentive mechanisms for installing rooftop solar. There's a bit of a, a little bit of like, you know, sometimes utilities don't like it when yeah. customers install solar on the rooftop. So it gets like kind of complicated that way. And then yeah. like, there's this whole debate about like, what's the value of solar on someone's rooftop. And there's been like debate for many years, especially in California. So and that if people are interested, like they can, like the NEM, that energy metering 3.0, that debate kind of going to, goes into the nuances of the value, the arguments for rooftop solar, how much to compensate people. So that's like a huge economic driver that dictates the cost of specifically rooftop solar. Hmm. But there's still opportunities to like just bring the cost of solar down, like full stop. Like I think there's like a theoretical limit of like, like silicon based, like solar PV cells. I think it's like, 50% efficiency. I think right now most commercial applications are like 15% energy capture. And so there's like a lot of room to develop, maybe using like okay. the most advanced NASA's solar cells. Like it has like pretty high efficiency. So like we still have like some headroom as far as to increase the efficiency of solar panels. There's like bifacial technology that can absorb light in both directions. And so there's new like technological improvements, like keep bringing the cost of solar down. Interesting. That's encouraging. Yeah, like a steady decline as opposed to like like a really, really big dramatical. Yeah, okay. Huh. Um, in Cities of the Future, so as far as I know, you're not an actor, you're an engineer. But Yes, it's very obvious from the film that I'm not an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm curious, what was that like? You know, you had this technical background and, and all of a sudden you're in uh, 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 an, an entertainment industry environment what were some things that happened during the course of filming that 
you just you never even knew to expect because it was so far outside what you're used to as an engineer. Yeah, it it was interesting, like experiencing the behind the scenes of a movie making process. So it was it was amazing just to seeing like how the crew, like the professionalism, like the production, like logistics, and, like how things are filmed with the cameras and lighting and setup and sort of how the director kind of like blocks everything for the perfect shot. So like, but for me, like the director was great because like that's sort of his specialty where he's getting non-actors to kind of look decent on camera. And so the, like the type of cues he would give, like the directions he would give is very like natural. It's not like, Hey, act this way or like get into like a zone and like memorize lines. It's more so Mm -hmm. like, Hey, like, Imagine yourself in this scenario that's very plausible. The thing is, is like I had to do like dozens and dozens of takes. <laughs> that was really I it. bet like, to get yeah. it just perfect, right? Yeah. yeah. How long did it take the entire filming process? It took at least a year. Okay. Um, so like every few months we would just have like a new like filming opportunity. So, like, Singapore, Amsterdam, Washington, D.C., various locations in California. So, it was was really spaced out for over the course of a year. Um, It was a a great experience. So, all the places that you visited, was there one in particular that, whether it was because of the, you know, the city or the town itself or just because of the technology, but do any of them really stand out to you as being just really, really cool or interesting or, or a valuable experience? I, so there, there are elements of each city that I absolutely loved. So in Amsterdam, it was really seeing a city that's, that can get by without cars for the most part, like, like such a walkable city, such a city that's just driven by bikes. And it was a decision that was consciously made by people. It's like, (laughs) Hey, (laughs) we're going to decide to run our city primarily off of bicycling, which I love. And kind of like minimized cars in the heart of the city, and I like I thought that was amazing because I would love it for cities like Los Angeles to like rely less on cars. Um, and then in Singapore, Singapore was just amazing because of the amount of greenery that the city is able to incorporate. Uh, again, it's it's a really in like it's near the equator, very humid, and so there there is a lot of kind of natural vegetation but just the way that they're integrating like nature into their urban landscape was was quite remarkable what are some of the biggest obstacles that you see for not just policymakers but infrastructure even engineers who are developing these technologies what are some of the biggest obstacles for going from where we are right now to you know where we where we hope to be 50 years from now yeah i think so short term, kind of going into medium term, I think we are experiencing a labor shortage. Like we don't have enough people to do the work that's needed, which is crazy, which is crazy to me. Like, yeah, like there are a lot of people on the earth, right? Where, where is everyone? <laughs> yeah. Like we need more engineers out here. We need more people to like, we need more construction workers and contractors. We just need, we just need more hands to build these things. Mm. And. And also, like, recovering from COVID and supply chain and inflation, like, things are more expensive. And also just cost. Like, we're, we're going to have to pay for this. And, like, do we have, like, are we willing to do that? <laughs> are we willing to, like, make that <laughs> sacrifice now for a yeah. better future? And then I think that's a question, like, for me, like, I'm privileged enough that I can and want to pay more for, like, a cleaner, more sustainable future. But, you know, a lot of people can't. Like, a lot of people, like, they're not educated enough. Like, they don't know. They don't have the means. They don't have the disposable income. Like, people living from paycheck to paycheck, struggling to pay their electricity bill. Like, yeah. like, for them, like, can we really ask them to, like, pay more for something that they don't immediately benefit from? So, I think that's going to be a big challenge. It's, like, how do we pay? And how do we make that, how do we make that cost? Like, how do we absorb that cost in a way that doesn't make people suffer? In the short term. Very insightful questions to ask. All right. Well, Paul, I'm going to ask you the the question that I I usually ask everyone as we're winding down and finishing up the episode, which is specifically within the context of your role as an engineer, 
What is one thing that frustrates you and also one thing that brings you joy? I think, yeah, when I was, I was like thinking about this, like, oh, I know it really frustrates me. I think some, one thing that really frustrates me and actually when I was a younger engineer, I was very naive. I had all these like aspirations and I wanted to do everything. I wanted to like fix everything. I had all these like big ideas. I was really seeing things that's like, like going into industry and seeing so many things like operate in silos where you have your team that's doing one thing. You have another team that's doing another thing. And then like a solution where if both of them work together, it would make everyone happy. <laughs> but <laughs> like they just, the teams don't talk. They don't collaborate. That was like the most like frustrating thing for me mm, as a younger yeah. engineer. And it still frustrates me to this day because this notion of like, we do things a certain way because that's the way it's always been done. But for me, that's like, like laziness. And I'm like, you know, if we're going to do the same thing, like all the time, like a task is going to be automated. <laughs> like, yeah, where's like the, where's like the innovation? Where's like the, the need to like do things better and collaborate. And so that's something that frustrates me to this day. And like, I'm always that person that's trying to like, I'm the annoying person to try and like innovate certain things like against that wall. Um, and then some of my biggest like joys is when I'm able to break that wall <laughs> mm. and I'm able to find solutions that like aren't like prescribed necessarily or like not it's not code or it hasn't been done before it's new it's uncomfortable for people but like we go through this like whole exercise and like everyone gets it and we're able to like use this new technology or new method just to just to like improve and so that's like one of like my bis- biggest satisfactions is one that's actually able to happen and i'm like in the room for for when it does awesome i love it well paul we'll we'll uh wind things down here but can you share uh where can people go to find the the movie cities of the future and is it available now or do we have to wait for a while so yeah just um keep an eye eye out on like science centers that'll be showing this so it'll be where imax films are played most likely in museums science centers it's starting to roll out in different cities. So just keep an eye out. It, it's bound to air wherever wherever you are. Um, or follow ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers. They'll, they're doing a lot of events, launch events for, for the premiere of the movie. Terrific. And how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, for me, um, I'm not too active on social media, but people can find me on LinkedIn. It's my full name. So Paul Suk Lee. So Paul, P-A-U-L. S-U-K-L-E-E. Just shoot me a message and I'd be more than happy to chat. Awesome. All right, Paul. Well, thank you so much for being on the show today. I sure appreciate talking with you. Yeah, likewise. This was great. You're a great host. Oh, thank you. All right. Until until next time. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you like what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing turnkey equipment, custom fixtures, and automated machines, and with product design, visit us at teampipeline.us. Thanks for listening.